Next up is Lisa Sharlin, Head of International Program, Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ASPE, as uh, probably um, more people are familiar with. Um, Lisa is Head of the International Program at ASPE with research interests in the United Nations and multilateralism, peacekeeping reform, Australia's engagement in UN peacekeeping, African security issues, Australia-Africa engagement, protection of civilians and women, peace and security. Since commencing at ASPE in March 2014, Lisa has conducted field research on preventing and countering violent extremism in Burkina Faso, Ghana and Kenya, and US, UN peacekeeping missions in Mali, South Sudan and the Central African Republic. She has authored numerous research publications and provided expert commentary to media and news outlets. Prior to joining ASPE, Lisa worked as the Defence Policy Advisor at the Permanent Mission of Australia to the United Nations in New York, where she provided advice on peacekeeping and defence-related policy issues. Lisa is a member of the Advisory Group on Australia-Africa Relations, uh, better known as AGAR, which is tasked by the Foreign Minister with informing Australia's thinking and policies on Africa. She also serves on the advisory board of the University of Western Australia's Africa Research and Engagement Centre, AFRIC. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, I'd like to say good afternoon to everyone in Perth. Uh, I'm uh, speaking to you from Canberra, and I'd like to start my presentation today by acknowledging that I'm speaking from the land of the traditional owners of the Ngunnawal people here and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Um, to spare you seeing my giant face on the screen, I have put together a very brief uh, PowerPoint presentation to guide um, a few points that I'm going to make. Um, so just bear with me while I bring that up. Okay. Um, so for those of you who haven't had a chance to um, interact uh, with, with ASPE, um, just to give you a brief overview, we're a think tank based here in Canberra that works on a range of different national security and defence issues. And you've had a bit of an overview there from Mark of some of the work that my program, the international program, is involved in. And some of that research work in recent years has involved um, undertaking field research, looking at the role of the mining sector in preventing and countering violent extremism. What I wanted to do briefly today with my presentation was take you through a, a few different things that are shaping Australia's current strategic environment um, and how we interact with uh, the African continent. Uh, and then secondly, I'll just bring that up there, um, have a little bit of a discussion about some of the security developments on the African continent at the moment, particularly in the context of COVID-19. Um, and I penned a, a very brief opinion piece that appears in the Paydirt magazine um, this month looking at some of those issues. Um, and then finally, I want to look at some of the shared interests between Australia and Africa um, as it relates to developments that we're seeing around the globe at the moment. Before I move briefly on to a bit of a conversation about Australia's strategic environment at the moment, uh, we've just had a virtual event here, such as the world at the moment, um, at ASPE tonight between the Australian Defence Minister and the German Defence Minister. And I thought it was notable that the topic of discussion was the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and as some of you would know, that's a region that, that has been defined broadly by the Australian government that doesn't uh, incorporate Africa. Um, but nonetheless, I thought it was interesting that the Australian Defence Minister made a comment as part of her remarks this evening um, that said geographic distance is an historical mindset. And I think that really resonated uh, with me, certainly, uh, before coming and talking about some of the shared interests that Australia has with Africa, because as we know, and as many of you know, as part of the mining sector, is that a number of the issues that affect Australia's interests and Australians um, do take place within Africa. And sometimes we have a tendency to, to overlook that because of geography. Um, and I think we sometimes see that playing out in terms of the discussions that take place here in Canberra as well. So I wanted to briefly provide a bit of a um, some scene setting in terms of some of the strategic discussions that have been happening here more broadly um, with, within um, different government departments about our shifting strategic environment at the moment, because I think that's pertinent when we're talking about security developments on the continent. We know, for instance, at the moment that our strategic environment has been changing rapidly. And this was something that was acknowledged in a recent strategic update released by the Department of the Defence that appears there on your screen. 
And that document, the Defence Strategic Update 2020, which was released in July this year uh, by the Prime Minister, um, examines some of the different drivers that are shaping Australia's strategic environment at the moment. And it notes that they are actually accelerating faster than we expected at the moment. So I wanted to take a step back. Um, there was a, a defence white paper that was released four years ago, and it identified six drivers of conflict that were going to shape the strategic environment to 2035. And I think it's pertinent to, to briefly go through this list and look at some of the shifts that we're seeing at the moment. And the six drivers of conflict that were identified there were the relationship between the US and China, the stability of the rules-based global order, the enduring threat of terrorism, uh, where indeed that particular paper did refer to terrorism um, coming from some ungoverned parts of Africa, state fragility, the pace of military modernization, and the emergence of new complex threats such as cyber. And when you fast forward four years to this defense strategic update, um, the finding is very much that some of those drivers have um, shifted forward much faster than we expected. And it notes the following. Um, that military modernization is accelerating faster than envisaged, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, and this includes the development of cyber capabilities, that the rules-based global order is being undermined and disrupted, that the, contact, the conduct of grey zone activities has expanded, and I should note here that by referring to grey zone activities, the paper does note that they're talking about activities to coerce countries in ways that avoid military conflict. So this includes things such as military militarization of territory, like we've seen in the South China Sea, uh, disinformation campaigns and economic coercion, um, and the use of cyber capabilities maliciously as well as another thing that was flagged. Um, and it also went in to talk about the emerging and disruptive technologies and particularly the use by these of non-state actors. Not surprisingly, it noted that COVID-19 COVID has altered many of these trajectories, um, with some countries using the situation to, to seek greater influence. Um, and I, th I think many of you would, would appreciate that we've seen a lot of that play out, um, particularly in the context of Australia's relationship with China in the region. And as I alluded to in the beginning, um, not surprisingly, the immediate region that is referenced in that paper is the northeastern Indian Ocean uh, through to Southeast Asia and the Southwest Pacific. So what does this mean in terms of engagement with, with Africa? Um, there's a few points I'll make there about current security engagement, and I have no doubt that some of the conversations that you have with Australia's Heads of Mission uh, later today um, can certainly illustrate this much better. Um, we do have, for instance, defence commitments at the moment in South Sudan and more recently in Mali as part of UN peacekeeping missions. Um, we do maintain a presence in terms of the ability of the Australian Defence Force and the Australian Federal Police to engage in security on the continent. Um, but what I would probably note, um, which I think is particularly relevant now when we're talking about global security challenges, is that those traditional security presences uh, are not the only barometer of the way that we need to engage with the continent. And when we're talking about whether it be grey zone activity, whether it be cyber, uh, whether it be disinformation campaigns, these are things that can have an impact um, and reach well beyond sort of geography. And I think it's something that we need to pay particular attention to because some of the activities that take place in these spaces certainly impact the way that private sector organisations operate, including mining companies. So why do security developments in Africa matter? And I only want to very briefly go through some of the trends that we're seeing, because again, I do feel that um, a number of you with companies operating on the continent have a much more granular understanding of some of these developments. But I think it's helpful to understand some of the trends. First of all, we have seen that terrorist activity has continued to shift from the Middle East to Africa, particularly in the Sahel. According to the UN, terrorist groups throughout Mali uh, and the Sahel have actually taken advantage of COVID-19, and I quote, to intensify their attacks and to challenge state authority throughout the sub-region with higher rates of civilian casualties. Um, and there are concerns, of course, that Islamic State is seeking a comeback in parts of Africa. Um, we've seen some events play out in recent months in terms of Islamic State affiliates continuing to undertake attacks in places such as Somalia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Mozambique. And you have the events, for instance, in Mozambique on the 11th of August um, with affiliates um, capturing the port there in um, uh, Mozambique's uh, Cabo Delgado province. Um, and similarly, you've had other security threats across the continent. This has been complicated further by COVID-19, of course. Um, if you take the case of Mali, um, for instance, we've seen poverty increasing, farming disrupted and concerning levels of food insecurity. 
We've also seen misinformation campaigns and conspiracy theories which have increased intercommunal tensions. And again, while um, Australia's sort of strategic documents that reference some of these challenges were focused on the Indo-Pacific, it is nonetheless um, that, that a number of these security challenges are in fact global um, and, and sources for concern. We also know, for instance, that a number of these security developments do have an impact um, on uh, the way that mining companies are able to operate on the continent. Um, and I know there would have been discussions the last few days about uh, community engagement programs, the way that mining companies uh, engage with the communities that they're operating with. And certainly some of the things that we found in our studies a few years ago was that it's those unmet socioeconomic needs, it's the structural inequality, inequalities, it's the poor governance and those types of factors that can in fact exacerbate some of the drivers that we see in violent extremism, for instance. And we do know that COVID-19 and, and some of the perceptions around inequality and the fact that it is actually driving inequality more deeply in parts of the world are going to be an ongoing concern. So what does this mean in terms of Australia-Africa interests? Um, and where can we perhaps find a convergence of some interests here that um, are, are going to further cooperation and particularly in terms of the way that the government engages? A number of you would know that last year, DFAT uh, held a conference in West Africa um, focused on uh, the West African mining, um, sort of the Australian companies that were engaging in West Africa in mining. Um, and there was considerable note there about the potential spread of terrorist threats further south to the region, to Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire in particular. And of course, we know that the mining sector is very well seized of a number of the security threats, given the attacks that we have seen on companies in the region in, in the last 12 months in particular. Yet COVID-19, I think, has highlighted a number of the shared interests between Australia and Africa that extend beyond geography. Um, and I want to make a brief note here before going into a few of those about the response of mining companies to some of these security challenges. And this is a point that I allude to in um, the article that I wrote. We have known that the operation of Australian mining companies in parts of the continent, and I think we heard from Bill Witham earlier today, that these have continued with a lot of work and support from the community in terms of being able to ensure that that can continue. Uh, we know that there are potential risks of an outbreak on a mine site, and this has the risk of not only setting back mining operations, but also having a devastating impact on local communities that make up the employees for the mining operation, as well as the reputation of the mining company involved. Um, and I have no doubt that a number of you are, are aware of some of the events that we've seen play out in South Africa, um, with estimates suggesting that thousands of employees in the sector contracted COVID-19 uh, not only leading to a loss of life of mining workers, but also in terms of a decline in the output of the mining sector. Experience has shown that mining companies do have a depth of experience in engaging with health crises on the continent, and we've certainly seen that with Ebola. Um, but I, I have no doubt that a number of companies are very aware that they don't want to be the ones responsible or the vector for introducing COVID-19 into the communities where they operate. Um, and I think we've probably seen some discussion of that in the last few days, and we'll continue to do so about the important mechanisms that have been put in place to mitigate some of those risks when mining companies operate. And I think this all goes back to concerns about securities as well, that companies will need to be cognizant of the way that they engage with communities, the way that they support them, particularly through this health crisis, uh, as we don't have a vaccine in sight at the moment. The final point I want to conclude on though briefly, and this goes to the slide that is sitting in front of you, um, is around where some of Australia and Africa's shared interests are. And I wanted to draw on a speech that the Australian Foreign Minister gave back in June uh, about Australia and the world. And this discussed quite broadly a number of the shared interests that Australia has when it comes to the multilateral system. Now, some of you may be aware that the Prime Minister gave a speech back in November last year and referred to the concept of negative globalism, spurning some concern that Australia was stepping back from some of its multilateral engagement. But we did find when we heard from the foreign minister in June that there was very much, um, a, I think, a renewed um, support for the way that Australia engages in multilateralism following on from an audit that the Department of Foreign Affairs had undertaken. And I think this COVID-19 has in many ways highlighted the, not only this, the challenges of international institutions, but also their strengths. And we saw this take place in May this year when Australia with the European Union and with the support, I should note, of the Africa group within the UN system, um, came together to support a resolution about an independent investigation into the origins of the COVID-19 virus. And I think this can be extended into the way that Australia and Africa have a number of shared interests. I want to highlight three points that were made by the Foreign Minister in that speech. First of all, she pointed out that um, Australia was going to target efforts to preserve um, 
three fundamental parts of the multilateral system, one being the rules that protect sovereignty, preserve peace and conserve, um, curb excessive use of power, and also enable international trade and investment, um, which I think would be of particular interest to the mining sector. Second, um, supporting the, interna the international standards related to health and pandemics. So often these are the standards that we, we don't think of as part of the international system that underpins the way we regulate, but are the, that are so essential for day-to-day -day business. Um, and finally, that Australia would be supporting the norms that, independ uh, that underpin universal human rights, gender equality, and the rule of law. Um, so I think in many ways, while talking to some of the aspects there of Australia's engagement in the multilateral system, I do very much see that as a vehicle where Australia has a lot of shared interests with Africa, uh, bilaterally with a number of countries on the continent, with a number of the regional and sub-regional organisations as well. Uh, and that also goes to the heart of a number of the security challenges that are being addressed on the continent um, and the way that multilateral institutions engage that are supported by Australia there. But I think most pertinently, we've seen it certainly through COVID-19 um, and the challenges that we face there. So a number of those shared interests, whether it be democracy and the rule of law, human rights, ensuring effective mechanisms of trade and investment are things that we can see shared interests around and certainly supported in terms of our relationships on the continent. Um, I would simply conclude on the point um, that I think more there are more opportunities for work to be done um, with various uh, African countries and organisations on these, these issues. We've seen the mining sector step up in a number of them when it comes to supporting, for instance, the um, sustainable development goals. And I think it'll be imperative that this type of engagement continues um, as we move through this COVID era and hopefully beyond it in the years ahead. So I'd like to thank you for your time today.